Hello and welcome back to World 360. Is India undertaking a geopolitical repositioning with PM Modi's visit to Ukraine and Poland this week? The US Security of State Antony Blinken makes his last attempt at a ceasefire in the Middle East, but are the odds stacked against him? How is China's economic slowdown spelling trouble for neighbouring Australia? We answer these and more in today's episode. So first up, Prime Minister Modi's visit to Ukraine and Poland. This is the first ever visit by an Indian Prime Minister to Ukraine. It also comes just over a month after Modi travelled to Russia, a visit that ruffled many feathers in the West and even invited a sharp critical tweet by none other than Ukrainian President Zelensky himself. India has always walked a tightrope between the West and Russia and now this is even more critical after the US and its allies reacted furiously over Modi's trip to Moscow. As mentioned earlier, let's not forget that the Ukrainian President Zelensky slammed Modi for hugging President Vladimir Putin of Russia during the Moscow trip. Zelensky called the hug a disappointment and a devastating blow to peace efforts and linked it to a missile that struck a children's hospital in Kiev that very day. Modi's visit to Russia last month had also coincided with the 75th NATO summit in Washington, D.C., where the West sought to shore up more support for Ukraine. PM Modi released a statement before leaving for Ukraine and Poland, which requires some analysis. On Ukraine, he said, I look forward to the opportunity to build upon earlier conversations with Zelensky on strengthening bilateral cooperation and share perspectives on peaceful resolution of the ongoing Ukraine conflict. As a friend and partner, we hope for an early return of peace and stability in the region. And therefore, lasting peace between Ukraine and Russia is expected to be the strategic thrust of Modi's visit to Ukraine. Apart from the ongoing war, diplomatic sources had told the print that talks between Modi and Zelensky will cover New Delhi's potential role in reconstruction efforts in parts of damaged Ukraine. This was also a major part of the agenda of the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba when he visited India in March. In June, India had also attended the Global Peace Summit on the War in Ukraine, hosted by Switzerland, though it opted out of the joint communique issued after the meeting. Let's not forget, also, that the Ukrainian side has been critical of India for its closeness with Moscow amid the war. Ukraine's foreign minister had said in December 2022, just months after the war broke out, that India enjoys the benefit of cheap Russian oil because someone in Ukraine is dying due to Russian aggression. But this year, Ukraine has started to reach out to partners beyond Europe and the West and is seeking engagement with players in Southeast Asia, like India and China as it seeks a resolution for peace and as that becomes increasingly necessary. Just recently, Ukraine's foreign minister visited China at a time when Beijing is also seeking to play a mediator role in the war. China has even put forth its own peace plan to end the conflict. Will India be positioning itself in a similar manner? For now, it's unclear whether India will float a peace plan like China has. So far, Delhi has reiterated that dialogue and diplomacy are the need of the hour and a negotiated settlement that is acceptable to both sides is necessary. The Indian Prime Minister will travel first to Poland from 21st to 22nd August and then to Ukraine on 23rd August. So stay tuned to the print as we track this important visit. For our second topic, we're looking at the Biden administration's last attempt to secure a ceasefire deal amid the Israel-Hamas war. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken made yet another tour of the Middle East this week, meeting key regional players like Egypt and Qatar, of course, apart from Israel and others in the region. Will Blinken be successful in this diplomatic mission? Well, time's running out as the American presidential elections near, and for now, a ceasefire and a hostage release deal seem unlikely as Hamas and Israel continue to signal challenges with one another. During Blinken's visit to the Middle East, he reiterated his call for Hamas to accept a bridging proposal for a deal. Let's look at his talks with the Qatari Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. In it, Blinken mentioned that it is important no party take actions to undermine efforts to reach a peace deal. And this is important given tensions between Israel and Iran, which backs Hamas, is high. 
Earlier this month, the killing of Hamas political chief Ismail Haniya led to fears of a potential strike by Iran on Israel and potentially the spillover of the war into the rest of the region. And therefore, Blinken's message clearly conveys that any provocation could derail the ceasefire efforts altogether. That said, reports have also emerged that the US has pushed back at reported comments by Netanyahu and others in his cabinet of making maximalist statements that are not constructive to getting a ceasefire deal, as reported by BBC. For our last topic, we're looking at Australia that faces or could face a two to three billion dollar hit caused by China's economic slowdown. And this is happening because China's economic slowdown is affecting iron ore trade between Australia and China. On Monday, Australia warned that the softness of China's economy and falling iron ore prices could hurt Australia's national budget. Now, iron ore accounts for almost 20% of Australia's total exports. But due to a slowdown in China's construction sector, iron ore prices have fallen and in turn have hurt one of Australia's most critical export commodities. Last week, iron ore prices fell to $81.8 per ton, below the Australian Treasury's $83 forecast. Weak economic growth figures in China in the June quarter and reduced demand for steel used for construction have created such ripple effects. On Sunday, Australia's Treasurer Jim Chalmers said, This is exactly why we take such a cautious and conservative approach to Treasury's forecasts for resource prices and revenue. We're following these developments very closely because of their potential impact on our economy and our budget. Now, even back in April this year, Australia's Treasurer had warned of lower revenue growth in the federal budget, citing China's economic downturn and the conflict in the Middle East and its ripple effects. We want to align our national security and our economic security interests, he had said. This entire episode has shown just how intertwined China and Australia's economic partnership is. Earlier, we saw how a diplomatic spat between the two countries had hurt this economic relationship. In 2020, back when Scott Morrison was the Australian Prime Minister, China slapped tariffs, sanctions and informal bans on about $20 billion of Australian goods, including coal, beef and iron. This came after Scott Morrison called for a public inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. When Albert Albanese won the Australian Premiership in 2022, his government made efforts to mend frayed ties with China and resume some semblance of normal trade relations. In January, China began lifting most of the tariffs on Australian goods, which was seen as the first of a series of overtures from Beijing. This summer, Chinese Premier Li Chiang undertook a four-day visit to Australia where he also visited its mining and winemaking regions. This was the first high-level trip by a senior Chinese leader to Australia since 2017. By June this year, Australia's trade with China jumped to record levels, with total trade reaching $145 billion in 2023, the highest ever. But will the new challenges in China's economy spell trouble for Australia, which was just starting to find its economic footing with Beijing? Let's wait and see. Thanks for watching. This is Pia Krishnkuti for The Print.